I introduce to you our presenter, Tom Cameron. Uh, <clears throat> now, there, there are two people. Uh, I'm going to be joined in a little bit by, uh, by Lucas, and uh, both of us have doctorates, and neither one of us have studied mushrooms. So, uh, and here we are talking about mushrooms. But I am not a mycologist. I'm a mycophile. And a mycophile is someone who loves mushrooms. And so that's the best I can do. And the best book on mycology on being a mycophile is that one over there that you see standing up against the a side. Just leave it right there. Yeah, that one, huh? By Eugenia Bone. Uh, and it's the most wonderful deep dive into mushrooms you've ever read. She's, if you're a good reader, if you're a reader, I suggest you get the book and read it. it it's just, it's hilarious. It's brilliant. She's a good stylist and a great cook, by the way, a chef. <clears throat> So, um, <clears throat> well, let's get started. Um, first, some facts about mushrooms. A single inch, cubic inch of forest soil can contain miles of what we call hyphae that make up a mycelium. These are kind of like roots. And as you read there, they filter, they unlock organic and inorganic mo molecules, they have enzymes that can do all sorts of things with the soil and make the nutrients available to growing things. Uh, they can extract nutrients from organic materials, but they can make the, uh, the uh, inorganic materials available to other growing things, and that's really important. Uh, these are hidden filaments. You can see there underneath those, those, those are called um, coral mushrooms. And underneath them, you see that mass of white stuff. And it's called a mycelium. It's com comprised of many, many of what we call hyphae. They, they merge together to make the thick strands, the single strands you can't even see. Uh, and they go all over the place underground. They are the mushrooms. That's the real mushroom. What you see is a fruiting body, like an apple. The, the, the mycelium doesn't produce its fruiting body the way a tree does, because a mushroom is not a vegetable. Did any of you not know that? You don't have to admit it. <laughs> because when I was in high school, they said that they, we always put fungi kind of in with vegetables and we didn't talk about it in biology class. I remember, I remember very clearly that uh, <clears throat> uh, my, my biology teacher was the pastor of, a, of, of the first Christian church, and he didn't believe in evolution and didn't talk about evolution, but he also didn't talk about fungi. <laughs> and it's really interesting because that is part of life force, in certain, but it's not about vegetables, and nobody studied. You could not get a degree in mycology except if you were a researcher in medicine. And that was the only kind of degree in mycology you could get for years. Now that things are changing a bit. Uh, <clears throat> the fungi live out of sight. And it's at least, <clears throat> it's very diverse. They're, I'm getting an echo. John, can we do, uh, not John, but... Uh, Scott, can, can we do something about this? I don't know how to, I don't, maybe my voice is too resonant, but I'll hold it back. Is that better? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, I, I hate echoing microphones. They, they just drive me nuts, and even if I'm speaking. So uh, <clears throat> here's the, this is an interesting fact, though. There's more biomass on Earth than we see. We know that. But up to 90% of all biomass on Earth is fungus. So what, what we are able to witness with our eyes and our senses, uh, way beyond that. Does everybody know what those mushrooms are, the big ones? Amanita. Amanita muscaria, a particular kind of amanita, <clears throat> they're, um, or a kin, kin group to it. We know now that there are many, many species that clump under the name of something like Amanita muscaria. 
The bright red ones are probably a different species from the ones that look like this. Uh, but they're, they, they're close enough, they have similar properties, and so we call them all by the same thing. Just like we call portobello mushrooms and criminy mushrooms and button mushrooms by different names, but they are the same thing. It's just, did you know that? That was our, yeah. The button mushroom was discovered by some woman in Ohio about, uh, oh, in the 20s. She, she was growing, these, it's easy to grow these things, and she was growing mushrooms, and this one, this white one popped up. And so she propagated it a little bit further, and then the commercial people got a hold of it and called it a button mushroom, told, called it something totally different. It's the same thing. Doesn't taste exactly the same, but it, it is biologically identical. Uh, 1,500, 1,500 plant species in the Pacific Northwest, 5,000 mushroom species. And we don't know half of them. We just estimate that there's that many. There has to be that many. But we don't know what they are. Of these, 100 are good edibles, 100 are toxic. Think about mushrooms on a bell-shaped curve, okay? At the ends are the delicious mushrooms and the killers, okay? The really exquisite ones and the bad ones. And in between, there's a sliding scale. And in the middle, there is a whole bunch of them on the good side that you would say, well, why bother, right? <laughs> you can eat them, but why would you want to? They don't do anything. And on the bad side, there's a bunch that are, oh, these taste awful. These don't make me feel good. These make me sick in my stomach. These make me throw up. These give me a really bad headache. These could kill me. So if you think about it that way, that, that's the way it goes. So uh, only a few of them really are deadly. There are more tasty, good mushrooms than there are deadly ones. Uh, what I'm holding in my hand here is a... Um, well, there it is, Cordinaria sanguinis. It's a red dye mushroom. There is a western coast red dye that's different from this. I wonder if I can hang this up here on my computer like that, oops, so you can hear me and I don't have to hold it. And I really don't want to hold the microphone. It, does that help, is that okay? Okay, great, okay. So, so <clears throat> uh, that's a red dye and the, uh, the coral colored mushroom uh, dyes over there, the yarn it was done with one of the, some of these and with an orange mushroom similar to it mixed together. That's why it doesn't have a brilliant color. And the, the uh, skein in front of the one that's brightly colored is the second soaking in the same dye water. And on the right side is a po dyer's polypore. That's that big, ugly brown thing over there in the, in the dark part of the, the tank. You can come by, and I'll have you pass some of that around in a minute. Uh, and those, they can make colors anywhere from brilliant yellow to dull, dull, dark brown, depending on their age. So, uh, there are around 400,000 plant species that have been identified, and I think my next slide says there are a million and a half fungal species, but only 100,000 have been identified. So mycology ought to be a booming field one of these days. And obviously it is, it is now. Um, by the way, that is a cordyceps mushroom. Uh, you see it growing there out of the larva of some kind of moth. Uh, how many of you are watching that TV show that has mushrooms coming out of people's heads? Uh, those... <laughs> Those are cordyceps. There's not such a thing as that. We don't have them like that now. But there is a cordyceps mushroom that will infect uh, ants on the floor of South American forest. And it will make them uh, do strange things. And they will climb trees and get up on a very high branch, way up somewhere. And when they get to that point, the mushroom then devours the brain of the animal and sucks its insides dry and then propagates spores all over the, the forest. So, and there are some others that are really weird that prey on animals. There's one that 
uh, makes little loops in its hyphae underground and uh, nematodes wiggle through them and when a nematode goes inside the loop, it closes down. It's really bizarre. I don't know this personally, but I've heard a report from a, a reliable source two months ago at the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society meeting. And I just as well give a uh, advertisement right now. If you'll go to kitsapmushrooms.org on Tuesday evening, you can find a link to our mushroom club meeting where we have presenters like this. Sometimes they're present, sometimes they're uh, distant online. But we've had some phenomenal programs lately. I'm just blown away. I had no clue I'd be hearing things and seeing things like, like I've seen and heard at, at, in Bremerton, would you believe? Just amazing. And, and uh, we've got a really good club, and you're welcome to come join us anytime. If you'll go there, it's $25 a family, by the way, for a year, if you want to pay. If you don't, just come to the meetings, you know. If you ever want to go on a foray with us, you'll have to pay up, because we take members, generally. Uh, it's too dangerous to the club to take non-members, you know, one of those things. Insurance doesn't like it. Okay, there's 17 botanists for every mycologist, and like I said, most of those mycologists are in medicine, so there's just not many mycologists around. Are you familiar with uh, fungi perfecti? Do you know Paul Stamets? Well, there are a couple of, couple of his uh, catalogs over there. If you are interested in mushrooms for health, or mushrooms to plant in your garden alongside your garden stuff to see to help the garden grow better and to get mushrooms too, you talk to, to him. Uh, he's got his offices in Olympia, and there's he, he's a phenomenal human being as far as I'm concerned. I'd, I'd give him money even if I didn't buy stuff from him. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so here are some facts. Mushrooms help fungus, not mushrooms, but fungus help us with bread, beer and wine, natural dyes, medicines, dyes, detoxification. We, 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 they, we've used fungus to uh, gobble up oil spills. They're doing all kinds of things in research now with what fungi can do to help us in the world. Any of you have a Dell computer? Well, if you did have a Dell computer, you would have received it in ship, a shipment, shipment of it and it would have been packed in a mushroom mycelium. Because they found that you can put the mycelium of some mushrooms in a mold and with a lot of the kind of food that the mycelium will go for. And you can let the mycelium develop and it grows and then you dry it and you've got a wonderful packing material. Which at the end of the day, you can put into your garden. So, by the way, somebody said she'd never seen a, a chanterelle. Here they are. That's in the back of my pickup truck, and uh, they are this big pile of golden joy. They're wonderful. Uh, how many of you have seen or gathered chanterelles here? Okay. So that means that your forests are old enough to show, for chanterelles to grow. That's good. Wouldn't you have loved to see Anderson Island before they cut down all of the trees for firewood? I heard, learned today on the boat that they cut down all the trees around here to stoke the fires on the Mosquito Fleet boats. That's why they denuded all, these, all this land. They, they, it, the, the Mosquito Fleet was going all over the place. They had boilers and no coal, of course. So what do you use? Well, you use wood. And they burned a cord an hour, a cord of, of about 30 inch pieces of wood. So that's a lot of wood. And I, my comment was that the, the, they, they had to be, uh, you had to build the boats big enough to hold the wood. I mean, they didn't have a tenders they had behind them. Anyway, uh, chanterelles require old growth forests, just like a lot of mushrooms do. And so that means if you know where chanterelles grow, lucky you, because Many trees, many of the woods on this, in the, on this island will not support chanterelles, and especially if they're near cedar trees, because cedar trees produce a substance in their 
their leaves they, in, the, in the greenery they drop and in their roots that suppress the growth of mushrooms. So there are only a few that are able to grow around. Okay, so here's a kind of tree of life for you to look at. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of names. I want you just to look at animals and fungi circled up there. You see that? Uh, evolutionarily speaking, and I am an evolutionist, by the way. I'll admit that, probably. Uh, the, uh, you'll see that uh, down at the... And I'm pointing like you can see my finger. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. By the way, if you've got a question or you want to say something, you know, wave, wave raise your hand or wave. Because I've got a lot of slides and I'm going to move along at a clip because I want us to get through this. But if you have a question, let me know. If you came with a burning question, you just got to have an answer to. If you can find a place to plug it in, do it. If you can't, talk to me later. Okay? That'll be fine. So, but I'm, I'm really, ha I'm moving along, so, but I, I do welcome interaction. And when, when Maureen said I did want to interact with you, I do. So, uh, uh, wave at me. Say, hey, Tom, or whatever, you know. Uh, anyway, you'll notice. Can you see it? Well, let me go to the next slide and you can see it better, maybe. Okay, that's better. So can you see there that uh, there's a line that comes up from where protozoa were? And it goes up to the middle of that bracket and it splits off into slime molds, animals, and fungi on the one hand and plants and algae on the other. So plants and algae are down here on the low end of the thing and then you see slime molds, animals, and fungi up there. I would have put fungi in front of animals because I am quite convinced that fungi arrived in evolutionarily before animals did, except, I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I think so. Because um, I can't imagine that animals would exist without fungi any more than I could, I mean, slime molds, obviously. Uh, do you know what a slime mold is? Well, look it up if you don't, you'll just it'll blow your mind. Uh, so, by the way, we have difficulty uh, developing antifungals because we are so, we share something like, I can't remember what the, the split is, thought I had a slide on it, but I guess I don't anymore, but we share about 65% of our DNA with funguses. It's the slide before this. Yeah. Huh? It's the slide before this one. Oh, really? Oh, there, D85%, I'm sorry. Common with fungi, only 60% with plants, 85% with, with fungi. So that explains why we have such a hard time developing antifungal drugs. And you know, and the, the uh, bacteria and all those things are over in a totally different part of the, of the, the tree of life. So getting them, finding ways to, to fight them is easier uh, than it is to uh, deal with, uh, and we don't have too, too many plant or out, we don't have things that infect us from plants, but fungi, yeah, they get to us, and we don't, we don't know how to, to deal with that right now. Okay, there are, there are three basic kinds of funguses. Uh, <clears throat> there are yeasts. These are single-cell creatures. They don't get any bigger than a single cell, they just grow. The cell divides, 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 divides. And if you've ever, uh, you all know, bake bread, you've dumped yeast in with some sugar and some warm water, and you've watched what happens. And you can actually see it beginning to fill up the cup before you put it into the bread. And the more it grows, the more it grows, the more it produces a gas, and that's what gives rise to the bread although I prefer sourdough. Um, uh, this is what we call vegetative reproduction, not because it has anything to do with vegetables, but it's just the name that they gave it back when, and they still use the silly name. So it's, called, it's, a, it's cell division, they divide like amoeba do. They just split and split and split. Um, there's imperfect fungi. That's a name that somebody back in the 19th century gave. 
and these are molds. These produce asexually. They have spores, but the spore has everything in it it needs to do to reproduce itself. So it just keeps going and keeps going. These are always, have short life cycles and they're always parasitic. And these are the ones that we're worried about the most. But it turns out that a mold is the thing that we've used for an antibacterial for years, right? You all know what I'm talking about. Penicillin. And, and its derivatives. So these are always parasitic. They always destroy the thing they're working on. And I threw away a package of five slices of cheese this morning because there was mold on the top slice. It got hidden. Did you hear my, 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 my vowel just then? Slice? That, there's my Texas. There's my Texas coming out. Okay. The top slice, slice had um, a mold on it, and I could see it spreading out a little bit, and I knew it was going down into the slices. And I didn't know how far it went, and I know how allergic I used to be to molds and stuff like that, and so I tossed all this really good Tillamook cheese. Too bad. Uh, way it goes. Fungi perfecti. These are mushrooms. They fruit annually. They grow from this mycelium that's under, underneath. They all have it. And they have sexual reproduction. And, and mushrooms are really weird when it comes to sex. They really are. I mean, there are... I, they don't have male and female. They don't have X and Y. They don't have A and B. I don't know what they have. I really don't know. I've, I've tried to find out. I've really, I've really looked at. I told my my cousin I was going to show her this, and I, I said I, we'll even talk about mushroom sex, and she said, "Oh my God!" And she turned and said, "Ron, Tom's going to talk to us about sex. Going to show us some sex, some mushroom porn, <laughs> mushroom porn." And uh, <laughs> that's not. I'm not going to do that. But they're they're really strange, and I'll show you what they do in a few minutes. I've got a slide on it. Believe it or not. Uh, they're relatively long-lived, under, long-lived, underneath the ground, wherever they are. If, if, it, if a mushroom in, infects or gets growing in a log that's rotting, it will live there until the log really just starts disintegrating. The mushroom will get all of, uh, everything that it can get out of it, and then a different mushroom will come along that can digest some other part that's left, and it'll work on that, and then another one and another one. And in the meantime, there are fungus, funguses all over the place that do the same thing. Can you imagine what our world would look like if it weren't for mushrooms? We'd have trees 100 feet, 150 feet ahead, up over our heads. We could not get rid of the vegetative matter if it weren't for funguses. So, well, we don't, there'd be some way, but we don't know what it is. So, <clears throat> There are types, mushrooms have different ways of eating. So we're going to talk about now how they eat. Some are what they call saprophytic. They decompose dead plant and animal matter. They live right on it. So who can name a saprophytic mushroom that digests dead stuff? Witch's butter? Pardon? Witch's butter, right? I, I'm not sure. I think witch's butter butter grows on on live trees. Oyster mushrooms. Oyster mushrooms do grow on on dead wood. They start out on the on the and and you've got my gosh, you guys have so many alder trees. You've got you, there's no reason for you all not to have jars and jars of dried oyster mushrooms in your pantry. All you have to do is walk out in the woods and cut them off there and, and cut them into a few pieces and put them in your dryer and dry them and use them in your soups, uh, reconstitute them and cook them to put in all kinds of things. The oyster mushrooms are fine. They're, they're quite tasty. And the ones around here are very good. And they're, uh, they're well worth eating. Uh, give me another example of a saprophytic mushroom. Turkey tails, right. 
and they, they, they grow on dead wood. You see them on these dead trees. They come back every year. What do you use turkey tails for? Anybody know? Uh, talk a little slower and louder. Memory improvement. Memory improvement, yes. They're good, good bolsters of health, the immune system. Take them and put them in a tea. Just drop them like they are or dry them and do the same thing, but they're wonderful. They, they, they will not hurt you, and they'll, they're, they're, they're good health support. Uh, you see the mushroom in the lower left, in the lower right-hand corner there? What's that? That's a white button mushroom. It is saprophytic. Any of these mushrooms that grow in the big barns that they sell, those are all saprophytic. The ones that grow on leaves are saprophytic. They're, de 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 they're digesting the leaf matter. Uh, there's some that work on debris that's deeper in the ground. Uh, some things you think are growing out of the ground, but they're really growing on a dead tree root. So they're, they're decomposing the something on dead matter. Uh, have any of you ever used magic mushrooms? No. They, no. Uh, <coughs> they, they, grow, they grow on cow piles. So, uh, as, as do many of the hallucinogenic ones. Okay. So, saprophytic mushroom, pardon? Saprophytic mushrooms uh, decompose dead plant and animal matter. They live directly on woody or animal material, and they live in hummus. Humus, not hummus, humus. Sorry. <laughs> By the way, I discovered that, that, the, that I've been told that Jewish people say hummus, they pronounce it as humus. Does anybody know? Or anybody, anybody Jewish? I don't know. Well, I prefer to say them different because I don't really want to eat humus. Okay, okay. <clears throat> that's a picture of uh, what's called a prince mushroom. Uh, one of the delights of the mushroom world. It smells like almonds. It tastes wonderfully wonderful. If you you can make the most amazing risotto or fried rice out of them. If you use uh, slightly toasted almonds and prince mushrooms and celery and a little bit of onion and oh my goodness. It's called the prince. Oh, oh, that's on the, that's under on the, uh, over on your left side. The one on the right is a, uh, oh geez, a golden foliota. And they just, that, that was growing in the park near my house. And they're beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. I've got some that have spikes on them that are just out of this world. But you can't, you can't eat those. They're not very good. So then there is a second kind of mushroom. And it is symbiotic. It cooperates with, it doesn't, doesn't digest the plant host. It cooperates with it. So... Can you see the little tiny strands of white stuff around the roots? Those are hyphae. That's mushroom hyphae. The roots are the dark things. So if you pull up a plant and it's got a whole bunch of white stuff underneath it, that's a fungus. And it's helping the tree to live. What we've discovered is that we would not have anything like the forests we have if it weren't for fungus. The fungus, funguses let trees interact with each other. Some trees merge their roots, but they communicate with each other long before the roots touch with the fungus that makes this amazing communication system. And it happens this way because the fungus needs um, sugar. Fungus can, the only thing that can create its own sugar is a plant, right? We're through photosynthesis. We know that sugar canes, sugar beets, they all produce sugar. Nothing, nothing can, no plant can produce, nothing can produce sugar but a plant, as far as I know. Uh, and funguses need them to grow, just like we do. A fungus is composed not of, of what's called chitin, same thing that is, makes the structure of an insect shell. 
And that's what gives mushrooms their strength. And they don't have organs. Everything moves through osmosis, just like it does with the plant, but it moves from cell to cell to cell to cell. And so there's not any, any digestive thing, except that the, where the, the place where mushrooms digest things is at the tips of their hyphae. And that's where they secrete enzymes to gather stuff. And these hyphae then go into the plants and they take sugar out of them and they move minerals and other things back into the plant roots to help them grow. Isn't that amazing? Yes, ma'am. We have quite a root rot problem out there yes, in right. the trees. And what part does hyphae play in that whole thing? Okay, the root rot is, is, is it's directly on the tree. Uh, and you're talking about, and it, it, they, the, the, it's, it's not a mycelium in the ground. It's, it's in the ground, but it goes to a tree and it infects the tree itself. And you all have seen uh, pieces of that. Uh, would those of you on the ends go over to that big box and pick up a single little piece of that thing uh, and pass them around? Just a little, just a little, little parts. Yep. Give them, give them, give them around the room and let people feel this thing. This is, this is a uh, uh, no, not the big one. Just the little things. You, you don't need to pass the whole big thing around. Just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give give them to people in the rows so they can pass them down. Like you're, like communion, you know, like you're passing the plate. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that way you can see what they are. This one is overdone. It's really old. And it's, uh, it, would, it would dye yarn dark, dark brown, but it kills trees. And, and these things decompose. They start, start the, the, the root rot, and it, it is a kind of killer. And it, any tree that it's got root, this root rot is on, it will die eventually. We don't know any way to keep from it. And there's a fungus, by the way. When I was in Texas, there was a fungus that, that infected live oak trees. The, the most gorgeous live oak tree I've ever seen is gone because it died of a fungal infection that nobody could figure out how to control. And so fungus is very opportunistic in the, this kind of fungus in, the, in that case. Uh, <clears throat> but in this one that I have up on the board, th let's see, there's another, yeah, okay. <clears throat> the tree on the right has a mycelium in it. The tree on the left does not. Look at the difference in the healthiness of they, they were the seeds were planted at the same time, they sprouted at the same time, and the one on the right is four times the vig, in vig, the vigor of the one on the left, and it's all because of the mushroom, uh, the uh, mycorrhizal mushroom that helps extract nutrients from the soil. Oh, I forgot to put in. I thought I did that. I know I did that just a minute, just two hours ago. Okay, these are wonderful mushrooms and they can't really be cultivated. We think, we know some people are, say that they can, they can uh, cultivate morels and I believe it because my neighbor and I found some growing in a planter box at a building that was being torn down in Bremerton a year ago. And I'm sure that that thing had uh, uh, year after year after year application of uh, oh thank you Maureen that's wonderful of uh, wow I didn't fall out of the chair uh, <clears throat> of chips you know wood chips and there is a particular wood chip morel and I think that's what we saw but uh, but they that the, the we, I've been told that there is someone who really knows how to grow morels. Nobody's figured out to do shant how to do chanterelles or any number of other wonderful mushrooms because we, we don't know how to make the, the, uh, uh, the mycelium survive. We don't know how to do that. We have to wait for the tree to get big enough to need the mycelium to help it grow and to fruit. So uh, they can't be cultivated yet. Wrong way. What's wrong with you? 
Oh, that's what I thought I'd put in. Okay, I did. I just forgot to take this one out. Oh, I don't know. Have you ever seen stumps like that in the woods? That are obviously growing and they're dead? Well, that's because their neighbors are taking care of them. First time I read about this in that wonderful book on the end down there called The, the uh, Secret Life of Trees, I absolutely cried. I could not believe it. That this forester had been work, working for years and he stumbles upon this rock. It's in Europe, in, in the Black Forest. And he sees all these rocks in a big circle about 10 feet in diameter. And he goes down and pays attention, looks at them, and it turns out they're not rock, they're, they're, co they're bark covered. And he realizes then, well, they're, they're bark covered because this is what's grown up from the, what was left of the tree trunk as it died. You, you've seen trunks that have died and collapsed in on themselves in the forest. Well, some are strong enough that the roots are still growing, so the roots would come up but they're not strong enough to grow a tree. So I have these little stumps. And the reason they're still growing is that their neighbors have taken over the root systems and are using their roots to support themselves and they're also supporting their neighbors. If that's not tree love, I don't know what it is. It, it's, it's amazing. Then there are parasitic mushrooms. And these are the ones that uh, live off a host plant like, or an animal, like I said, they attack living trees. They are really killers. This is a honey mushroom. You see them growing up the tree there and down, down along the roots. Honey mushrooms are real killers. And they're not the root rot killers. They're the tree killers. Uh, there is a, the world's oldest, largest organism is now 2,450 years old, maybe. Uh, it's three and a half square miles. It's in eastern Oregon. And if you've driven from Pendleton to Grant City or something like that, along that highway, you've driven through that fungus. It's three and a half square miles. That's a lot of land. And the reason it's growing that way is that it started there 2,400 years, old, years ago in the middle and it grows, grows out. It just keeps growing and growing out. And still infects the middle so that nothing that it infects can grow in the middle. And, but it just keeps growing and growing and growing. They, they say it, no, it's the same thing because they've tested, they, they've done DNA tests all around the edges of it, and it's all the same organism. That's pretty amazing, right? Uh, some trees that are not infected by this particular uh, mm -hmm. mushroom, yes. But not any, uh, not any firs, not any uh, pines, not any hemlocks, I'm sure. Is it all underground? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. No fruit? Oh, no. Oh, I'm sure they fruit when they, you know, at the, but it fruits around the edges. There's not any fruiting that I know of going on in the middle. But I, I haven't been there, and I don't, I don't, I've just read what they'll report about it. But I have questions, too, and I don't know. They, I've never read anything about that, so I'm not sure. What time is it? It's hmm? to Okay. So uh, I didn't get started till 7.15. So can, can I get an hour out of you guys? Is that okay? Okay. Okay. All right. So... <clears throat> So here we go. Start with a full-grown mushroom, and it drops spores, okay? And the spores are male and female, or X and Y, or A and B, or George and Patricia. I don't know what. <laughs> but there they are. They're male and female. And they toddle along until they get Twitterpated, like Bambi said, like Thumper's mother said in Bambi, and they say, oh, wow, look at you. And they get together. And when they do, they have a combined cell that has two nucleuses. 
One is male and one is that one from one, whatever sex that is, and one from the other one. And they're calling them X and Y in this, in this thing. And so then, then when they do that, they just keep growing. And they, then that really spurs them along because when they have cooperation, with, then that really gets them going and they send out more and more hyphae and uh, they keep growing and they keep on growing. Uh, and uh, eventually one of them forms a pinhead and what calls, whatever call the pinhead comes from is probably the right conditions like not too much or too little water, not too much or too little heat, not too much or too little sunlight. Uh, sometimes we think it's pressure because you've seen mushrooms growing up alongside a trail when they don't grow anywhere else. Uh, I think they grow sometimes till they can't grow any farther and say, uh-oh, we're in trouble, got a fruit now. So, and they pop up. But something makes them, we don't know really what it is, but th those are speculations. And a baby mushroom comes up. And, oops, wrong, wrong button. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it's full grown and then it drops spores again. So that's the life cycle of the mushroom. So how do we identify mushrooms? Well, let's start with gill mushrooms. You know there are a lot of different kinds, but you may not know that there's as many as I'm going to talk about, and there's a lot more than I don't say. Uh, on the mushrooms that you get from the store, how many of you have never noticed the ring on a portobello? Have you seen a ring on the stalk of a portobello? Probably haven't noticed it. When you get the, the criminy mushroom, the little brown one that's all closed up, you, you've seen the inside of it, it's, it grows and it starts to separate, and you see that stringy stuff around the middle. It's just, it's just kind of growing out. Well, that is the ring on the stalk. The way a mushroom grows, it starts down here, and it comes up, this thing, the stalk starts pushing, and it pushes the stalk up, and it's all in one piece, and when it gets to a certain point, then this thing that's up at the top begins to separate from the stalk. And when it does, sometimes it leaves a ring and sometimes it doesn't, depending on the mushroom, and it opens up. And we call the top the cap or the pileus. We call the thing that grows up a stalk or a, I, I've been, modern mushroom, modern books call it a stipe. S-T-I-P-E. And they call it that because that's the name specific to mushrooms. Because a stalk could be a stalk of a corn stalk, right? And so they, they, they're beginning to call that a stipe to differentiate it from other things. So we borrowed names from, from vegetables uh, uh, in a lot of this. At the, you see the little sack at the bottom that's called a vulva. By the way, the early mushroom guys were mostly guys and they sexualized everything so so and and you must admit that the growing mushroom is rather penile in shape and form and it grows up and it comes out of a vulva okay there you are so wh what you've got down here at the bottom it this is particular to the amanitas and if you don't know that what you've got is not an amanita you should never pick it and take it home and think you know what it is until you see its root system. Because you can't identify a mushroom unless you know how it came out of the ground. Uh, by the way, have you ever noticed that the amanitas have these little white spots on the top of the cap? Well, that has, that's a universal veil that goes over the amanita. And it's, it's a big thing. It, 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 and some people take baby amanitas home and cook them thinking that they're puffballs. And they're not. <laughs> and it's really, uh, really too bad. But you see cap, you see the ring, you see the gills. Okay, this on the right side is an oyster mushroom. It grows to the side, the gills come out not like a fan, not like, not like in the middle. Uh, 
By the way, did any of you notice the tarot cards over here? I got those as a gift only two days ago. And on the back side of the card is a spore print. It's the coolest thing. He's really clever. Okay, so these are gill mushrooms. Okay. But for every mushroom, we can say the cap is either cylindrical or conical or bell-shaped or umbonate like an umbrella or convex, right? Or concave, and we don't just say concave, we call them depressed or funnel-shaped or umbilicate because it looks like a belly button, right? <laughs> or uplifted on the edge, or plain, right? Flat straight across like a, like a, a, a what am I talking about? We throw them in the park. Frisbee. Frisbees, thank you. Sometimes I have a word and sometimes I don't. Look at the way the, stat, the, the gills can be attached to the stalk. Some are free. If they're right up against the stalk, we call them adnexed. They're narrowly attached. Some of them are notched. Some of them are broadly attached. Some of them run down the stalk, decurrent. A chanterelle has what are called decurrent gills. Except that, what do you call that cap? It's kind of funnel, but it looks like a flower, don't you think? So they need floral. And those things that we call gills are not gills, they are all put together, they're hung up together in lots of different ways. If I could zoom in on this, uh, I've got an old uh, kind of PowerPoint, so I can't. But do you see how those are ridges? We call them ridges. So we generally put chanterelles in, uh, into a, a mushroom, into the, uh, uh, the gill mushroom category, but they're really not gills at all. So, well, that, that's, that's the first big exception to the gill mushroom category. Then there is what we call the pored mushrooms, P-O-R-E-D, or ones that have pores. And look at all the names that they've developed to talk about those different parts of that mushroom. Does it seem excessive? Well, the problem is it's excessive except that if you can't pay attention to the reticulation on a bolete, you might pick up one that is deadly instead of one that is delicious, or one that tastes horrible instead of one that tastes good. Because some stipes are reticulated, some have dots, some have scabers, S-C-A-B-E-R-S. -E some don't have... Uh, uh, some have basal tomentum. They're at the base where they're, they're all uh, scarred and, and rough looking. Um, some of the stipes are turned to the side. Some of them are straight down. Some of them come to a point. And so identification of mushrooms gets to be really hard. I mean, it's... it's you can learn two or three and recognize, yes, I would recognize that anywhere. And I do that with a chanterelle. I can spot a false chanterelle 50, 50 feet down the trail. And I know it's not a chanterelle. And then I can walk up onto a golden leaf and be only five feet away from it and still think it's a mushroom. So... So it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's an, it is a very exact science. And it's, it's kind of like uh, my problem that I had when I was teaching students how to write. If you want to write well, you have to know everything. Where do you start? Well, where you start is with somebody who knows what they're doing. It, the best way to go, learn how to do, go mushrooming is with somebody who knows how to go mushrooming. 
and it, it and you learn a great deal just by osmosis or by discussion or by I don't know what but um, you learn how to use a lot of these words before you even know it because you're in the field paying attention to them I'd hate to have to study mushrooms in a schoolroom and think that I learned about them uh, because there's you, you just have to be there and smell the forest floor um, well do you see the tubes uh, there are a lot of mushrooms that have just tubes. How many of you, have all of you seen mushrooms that have tubes underneath the, the, the cap? Okay. Because uh, a lot of people haven't noticed that. Uh, okay, this is, uh, on the right is a photograph by, uh, by Lucas. On the left is a lexinium that I photographed. I picked in the parking lot at Safeway. Uh, it was growing under a, a red photinia in the parking lot. Uh, the one that I'm holding there, I, I think is a, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but it's, uh, it's some kind of king bolete. I know that. It's got to be a king of some kind. Uh, and uh, it was growing under a spruce tree. So I'm pretty sure it was a king bolete. Uh, and it was pretty well done before I ever saw it. You know, I was driving down the street and went up to the door and said, may I have that mushroom? And the woman said, what mushroom? And so it was okay, you know. Um, I didn't know that thing was there. Anyway, polypores. Can you see the little tiny, they're, they're little bitty pores and they've even got patterns. You see that funny pattern up there? Look like squares diamonds I don't know whether that's in it's not in the film because it's not a film it's a digital but you see all kinds of hidden patterns up in these things somewhere this is an albatrellus fledii uh, I took one home from a mushroom club show uh, several years ago that was a shelf about this size it was just a big big shelf it was a beautiful blue thing about that thick in parts and I ate on that thing for over a week. Uh, I'd slice a steak off of it and fry, you know, slow cook it in butter. And anything slow cooked in butter is good, but, but it was, but golly, it was delicious. And if you look at the book, it says edible but not popular. And I think these people just haven't tried. You know, I, I, I'd give anything to find another albatrellus fledii. And it's not an albatrellus anymore. Its name has been changed. And so my favorite mushroom book is that little tiny thing over here on the table right here that I've declared is the, it says all that the rain promises and more. And it has a picture, yeah, has a picture of a man with a trombone wearing a tuxedo. Obviously he plays in a symphony orchestra somewhere. Uh, and he's out in the field with his trombone uh, looking for mushrooms. His name is David Aurora, and he also wrote that huge book that's leaning against the wall. And if you've never tried to key something out and find out what it is by looking at its properties, you ought to look at the keys in that book. It's fascinating. I learned how to do this first off because I found a Suillus mushroom, which is a kind of boletus, has pores in it. I found one the size of a small, small luncheon plate in, in my park near where I live. And I didn't know what it was, so I looked online and I found the president of the Mycological Society and I called him up and he said, uh, oh, Forest Ridge Park? Well, I just live on, just on the edge of it. And he, I said, which edge? And he said, down toward, toward, the, uh, toward the water. And I said, I'm on the north end. So we met in the middle of the park and he brought his truck and he brought that book and he laid it out on the back and he showed me how to figure out what mushroom I picked up. And I was hooked. Uh, I thought, wow, that's exciting. But I still use that book because it's the most useful, useful book in the field. I don't care whether the names are wrong. I can't misidentify what I'm looking at if I use that book. Because he's got all the characteristics that are important uh, not the big one. I'm talking about the little one. No, no, the one you just picked up. 
Yeah, that. That's the field guide. And, and I still say it's the best, best book for novices around. And it's, by the way, there's a list of books over there. And this is All the Rain Promises and More. And it's a little tiny thing. And it is truly marvelous. I, I think David Aurora is remarkable. This is a toothed fungus. Have any of you ever eaten a hedgehog mushroom? This is, this is the uh, umbilicatum, the belly button hedgehog. There's a, it, they're only about this big around, and they've got a little dent right in the middle. There's bigger ones that are about this big around, and some people say they're, they're harsh or they're strange, but I've never eaten one that was bad in my life. Uh, they're more delicate than a chanterelle, a little bit like a chanterelle, very good. Uh, but these are tooth mushrooms, and some of the most amazing mushrooms have t these funny teeth that hang down. Um, <clears throat> and then there are all of these weird types. I mean, the thing up on the upper right is called a bird's nest fungus. It's a mushroom, and it has its, its sexual parts are in the cup. Uh, there's a jelly fungus there growing on a tree. Uh, and I don't know how, it, it must slough spores off of its outside. Uh, the thing standing up there is a, called a witch's saddle. A hel uh, he I could have sworn I put all of the names on this file, but it's not. Elfin saddle. Elfin saddle, yeah, elfin saddle. Uh, this, is a, this is an edible mushroom, but you have to either... Uh, Cook it very, very well outside. Say outside because it will give off a gas kind of like jet propulsion fluid. Uh, it will, if you inhale it, it, it can really hurt you. Uh, you can freeze them for several days and that supposedly gets rid of them, rid of it. But uh, they're supposed to, you know, we can grind them up and make a really good sprinkle for for uh, sauces and soups. Okay, <clears throat> we've already looked at chanterelles. Look at that thing in the lower left corner. Isn't that beautiful, the underside of it? Just gorgeous. I like to crawl around down on the floor of the forest on my stomach, just crawl, go down there and walk up, get up to a chanterelle and look at it eye to eye and turn around and lie down and look up through the salal at the sky through the trees. It's, a, you know, it's really wonderful to me. In Texas, fire ants, scorpions, rattlesnakes, roaches, mosquitoes. It's wonderful. <clears throat> okay, this is Cantorellus formosus. There's a white chanterelle on the left. There is a pig's ear, they call up on the upper right, and if you eat those young, they're delicious. On the lower right-hand corner is Callie, my sweet border collie, who's no longer with us, and um, <clears throat> uh, the winter chanterelle, which I think is just wonderful with, uh, with pasta and butter and, and uh, garlic. That's the pile. Okay, the fly agaric or the Amanita muscaria uh, is kin to Santa Claus. Uh, the, story, the, the story is that Santa Claus comes from this mushroom, that the Santa Claus myth originates here. That the shaman in tribes in Lapland uh, were people who came around in the wintertime and distributed these mushrooms that had been frozen and were no longer likely to kill you uh, or dried and uh, people ate them. Uh, Lapland males ate them in their sweat lodges and had remarkable trips, and jumped in the water, jumped in, you, I remember reading about this in the fourth grade, about these guys going into their sweat lodges and, and, uh, having, and, and then jumping in the water and I couldn't figure out why would they do that. They're obviously stoned out of their minds. And, and, uh, and I also think that the Laps Men died sooner than the women because they ate these mushrooms and the women didn't. So uh, they will destroy your liver eventually if you're not careful the way you prepare them. They are ultimately poisonous, not immediately. I've heard that this is much worse 
then the then the um, um, the Amanita muscaria, the pantherina. Have you all seen the pantherina, the, the golden one? They're really beautiful. And by the way, those flecks on the top are part of that veil. And it, when it disappears, when it gets, when the mushroom starts growing, all of that cracks and makes these things that appear about on the top. There's my friend Nelson with the biggest mushroom I ever saw in my life. It weighed, I think, near three and three and a quarter pounds. Uh, we know it's a bolete. We're not really sure what it is. I dream that it is a California, uh, that it's an edgeless grandella. Yeah. Well, that it's the big uh, bolete that grows in Northern California that's made its way up here because of global warming. That's what I'm wishing it is. But I haven't found anybody to do DNA tests on it, so I need to do that. On, the, on your right is, a, is what's called the Boletus mirabilis. Uh, it's a really beautiful mushroom. The, the cap is fuzzy and um, um, cordovan colored and it has a lemon flavored yellow inside. The, the spores are. Uh, Matsutake, the uh, Tricholoma maglavera. Uh, Prized edibles. Uh, if you have you ever seen the little candy cane things growing in the woods? You see those things over on the right. It's a non-chlorophyll plant, plant that doesn't use chlorophyll. If you ever see those, that means that there's a matsutake around somewhere because they parasitize matsutakes. And uh, if you see the smile on that guy's face, it's because he's really, really happy. This is a short stem, woo, this is a short stem russula. Uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, they're, uh, they're beautiful. They can be this big around. They, they just, they push the forest duff up on top of them. There's be this big pile of, of, of uh, leaf matter on top. And they push up underneath it. And then if you're lucky, they turn into, oyster, they turn into lobster mushrooms. Because, Hypoma because Hypomyces lactiflorum is a fungus that infects them and turns them scarlet in color and really makes them tasty. They're not worth, this is one of those that you can eat it, but why? But when it gets, turns into a lobster mushroom, and there's a lot of, it's really wonderful. They're crunchy, tasty, delicious. This is also the pickup bed with uh, my one of my favorite mushrooms, Russula zarampolina. The Brits call it the crab brittle gill. Isn't that perfectly British for you? Um, they smell like crabs or shrimp when they're older. They, uh, the little caps are wonderful stuffed. If you stuff them with some kind of good, good thing, and you, you broil them and you eat them, uh, they don't turn mushy, they stay kind of crunchy. It's really, really delicious. And you'll notice that they have a viscous coating on them. You see how shiny that one is over there? By the way, the, there are lots of red colored mushrooms in the woods. And uh, um, the way you tell that this is a good one is that you take its cap and you bite a little piece of it off and you taste it and you spit it out. And uh, if it tastes creamy and really good, it's what you want. And if it starts getting hot on your tongue after about 30 seconds, it's not. And th that's kind of how you know. Well, I'm taking more time than I intended to. I've got all of these slides. And I wanted to give Lucas a chance to talk about some things that he's seen here in the woods around here. So shall we do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots of mushrooms that look a lot alike, and uh, this, I must, must admit, is, a, is longer than an hour program. By the way, can you see the woodpecker in the hole up there? Yeah. I'll just look. These are uh, oysters that people grow at home. Uh, wonderful shelf mushrooms. These are edible usually along the edges, on the growing parts. 
Um, I was trying to find, there's a conch, that's probably the conch you found over there, uh, and it's a, a varnished conch. Uh, turkey tails, everybody's seen. Uh, now that is a dyer's polypore in the upper right-hand corner that's living and growing. And the ones over there on the, in the box have been dead a long time. And there are some examples. Of, look, look at those colors. Well, this is the end of my part, so let me uh, put my... Uh, from the Kitsap Peninsula Mycological Society, thank you very much. I want to thank especially Maureen uh, for her help in getting me over here and to do this. And I've, I've enjoyed being with you, and I hope you've had a good evening. Yes, ma'am. That's the question. Uh, for my part, I, I am careful to extract the fruit from the, you all want to come get set up up here with this stuff? Uh, I, I try to pull the, pull the mushroom up out of the duff as easily as possible so I don't mess it up. I cover the hole so stuff can't get down into it and infect it. Uh, I'm careful where I walk because I know that every time I take a step, I'm stepping on a mushroom or on the, the, I'm packing the ground down. My favorite place to go for chanterelles is no longer worthwhile because too many people have beaten, the tra beaten it down and I don't, never see any chanterelles there anymore. So uh, that's the way things happen. And that was me a, a lot, several years ago, actually. Thank you very much. I can talk loud. <laughs> Good evening, I'm, I'm Dr. Lucas, and uh, I've been foraging out on Anderson Island for just over a year now. So before I moved out here about a year and a half ago, I didn't know anything about mushrooms. Uh, I knew a little bit, like I think I found a couple of oysters out on a trail with people who knew about mushrooms, but I didn't have any knowledge or or I had a passion, but I didn't really know anything about them. I have a plant background, of course, because I do herbs, but uh, I just got, got really interested on my own and found a couple other people on the island who was really interested and in, uh, just sort of self-taught myself. And like Tom said, it's, it's a lot more fun when you're with people who know a little bit, but it's also a lot more fun when you're with people who are as passionate about them as you are. So just find people who really like mushrooms and go out and hike. I'm going to try and make myself a little bit more available through the spring and then through the fall to do some hikes um, to get people out on the trails and just start looking for mushrooms and, and exploring together. So I look forward to seeing you guys do that. I just put together a couple of slides because I knew I'd just be at the end. Um, I would say uh, over the last year I've probably found over 150 different varieties that I've identified just for fun. And I probably have over uh, 1,500 pictures of mushrooms that I've been taking and trying to learn about. So um, you can go out and know nothing and just get a couple of field guides or... So I got a, a couple of apps on my phone that were uh, for finding and identifying mushrooms. You can just take a picture of the top, take a picture of the bottom, it scans it, and it gives you a couple of choices. So that it gives you, it doesn't really give you the ID, but it, it'll give you a place to start, at least for me. So. So most of the places that I look for mushrooms uh, are just on the regular trails. So I hit up Andes uh, a lot, both Andes. I hike uh, pretty much weekly. Uh, Jane Cammon is a real great one to look at. Uh, Idolush, is that how you say it? Idolush, I always get it wrong. Uh, Love, can you make this work again? It's coming. Okay, it's coming. Uh, I hike on that one, and also uh, Jacob's Point is good, and then I, I forage kind of in between sites uh, just to see what I can find. Uh, last year, I was like in rain gear, and I had boots, and I was out every time it was raining, or three days after the rain, I kind of just went everywhere up 
in the churches. I'd go down to the dog park and just kind of go everywhere I could to find as many as I could. But now I mostly stick to the trails because I find so many on the trails. So the, all these pictures that are up here are from our trails here on Anderson Island. Uh, this was a pretty big find um, on Jane Cammon last year. So this was a really big mushroom, uh, I mean, uh, oyster mushroom harvest uh, that happened. Uh, you can you can sometimes start to see them coming on. So like if you start having spots that you like to pick, you can start watching them like, okay, three days, I'm going back to get those mushrooms, right? So you have to kind of keep looking and, and following your mushrooms by going out and hiking often or walking the trails at least often. Yeah, it'd be more like picking an apple yeah. than taking a plant. So if you can think of it that way, I also pick the apples on the island. So <laughs> they're pretty good. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, and you can learn. I mean, it's common sense. Like if I'm picking mushrooms and I'm especially oysters, I'm going to want more oysters. So I'm not going to clear off a whole entire uh, area. I usually take some and try to spread the spores more around in the area so that when I come back next time, it'll go again. Yes, Tom. The oysters, if you'll cut them off and leave the mm -hmm. base, Yeah, so it's nice to have one of these guys so you can cut cut your mushrooms off at the bottom or cut them off the tree and then, you know, instead of washing your mushrooms, you're going to want to dust them off. Yeah. So these are just some that I've found while I've been out on the trails over the last year, some of my favorites. I've seen a lot of oysters. I have um, seen a lot of the Amanita, Muscaria, and also we have, last, this last year we had a lot of the panthers who were out. There was so many of them, pretty much everywhere you walked. Uh, you'll see a lot of the shaggy manes out. Most of the trails, you'll see those in the springtime. Yeah, it's really fun to collect them, bring them home. I think last year I put cardboard out on my front deck and I would just bring mushrooms home constantly and just watch them dry and see what happened to them and see kind of what they turn into. There's lots of ways to explore them. Yeah. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. I didn't see any of those uh, this year, but last year they were everywhere. Uh, God, they're just gorgeous. The first time I saw one was uh, I used to go out with my headlamp at night and look for mushrooms while I was walking the dog with the bright headlamp, and I, I just saw this bright purple something coming from the ground, and, and I started seeing these more and more after that. But when they're really young, they're really vibrant purple, and then they get a little bit more faded as they get older. But. Yeah, are those edible? Uh, they're edible, yeah. I mean, they're not tasty. They're not uh, <laughs> an edible that people look for to eat, but they are... Uh, most of the Lacarias are. 
Um, this is one that also has a correction. Yes, Tom? Yeah. The middle one. The thing is, the middle is the geometra in Vila. It is uh, it, it's more poisonous than the e ones on either side. But uh, the geometras are generally pretty dangerous. But they look very similar. They have the same kind of soft base. And they're all kind of kin to the morels. Yeah, they're just amazing. Yeah. Like when you come up on these, you're like, it looks like an alien or something. Like you just, they're just so prehistoric, exactly. They just look like a tree growing, but they're amazing. These three are some you should never let your dog get near. Yeah. Kill your dog. I have so eaten many these. Mushrooms, many mushrooms must be cooked. You shouldn't eat any raw except the kind you buy in the, uh, the button mushrooms. That's all. Yeah. So these ones I mostly found out on, uh, what's the part of the trail on Jane Cameron that goes down to the picnic area? Yeah, the trail from there to there, you'll see, this is where I see these every year, it's on that trail. Uh, here's the Russellas, again, uh, I really like them a lot. There's one up there that's called the Blackened Russella, you'll see that on the trail from the back of Jane Cameron down to the farm. Uh, there's a whole bunch that grow uh, that you'll see out there. And uh, I learned the same trick that Tom was talking about last year. I was learning which ones can you eat, which are the ones that are going to taste good, or which are the ones that are going to make your stomach hurt, and the taste test. So every time I see the Russellos now, I just take a little bite. And when you taste that, when you give it a taste test to see if it's one you want to eat or not, when it is hot and spicy, it is hot and spicy. It's not just like, oh, I can't tell. It burns your mouth. So then you know to walk away from that one. Yeah, it's hot. Yeah, Tom? Yes. But the other ones, the shrimps and the crabs, are really good. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, bolites. Uh, I see mostly Zeller's bolites, which I think is on the far right over there. I think so. Yeah, it's more like a red top with a yellow bottom. Uh, the one in the middle was pretty big. It was probably like a foot, maybe a foot tall and a... Yes. Yeah, king. That was the only king I've ever found out here, but I know we have them. Yeah. More types of slime molds. We have a lot of those. Uh, these are not slime molds. Oh. By the way, these, okay. are, these are jelly mushrooms, but they're not slime molds. Well, we have a lot of jellies. Yes. Yeah. So, I, like I said, I'm not a mycologist. I just call them wherever I can learn more and more about them. Uh, we've got a lot of those out there, all different colors. They're so beautiful. Uh, there's this guy has some amazing photographs. Just really beautiful. Yeah. They're edible too. They're edible too. Yeah. You can put eat them. Those. In salads. They can be eaten raw. So put them in salads for, for color. Yeah, they're fun to eat, but they don't have a lot of taste. No. Yeah. <laughs> they taste like gummies. Uh, of course, there's a lot of turkey tail out here, so it's a nice one to collect. I usually take the turkey tail and put it in bone broth or a broth. Uh, you can cook it down as a tea has good medicinal properties, uh, immune function, and just really good. You see these everywhere. They're on all the trails. They're really hard. They're, uh, if you haven't felt the conchs before, we've got a bunch of different kinds out here. Uh, you'll see the red belted conchs pretty much every trail. Uh, and consistently through the year, uh, they're always out. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, they're gorgeous, so you can see those all the time, too. Um, and then, of course, the millions and millions of what they call the LBMs. There's little brown mushrooms out here that you can spend your whole life trying to identify all of them, and you'll never get to it. So I just wanted to bring some pictures out so you guys could be encouraged to get out on the trails, and hopefully we'll be able to get out there together. So.